Influential documentaries like Cowspiracy and What the Health have tried to shed light on the intensive meat and dairy industry, exposing the impact it has on animal and human health, as well as the wider environment. A couple of years back, renowned environmentalist George Monbiot tried to address a debate on the Oxford Farm Conference under the motion that by the year 2100, meat eating is going to be a thing of the past. However, do you think amid the vegan revolution, the meat industry is actually going to die? And is meat consumption the real problem or is the real issue the way the industry operates at the moment? Well, that is what we're here to find out on today's edition of ABTV's Crossfire Debate. Let us know what you think in the comments below. Why is the coronavirus going on right now? because of the China meat market. Yeah. So if we completely eradicated that market and we turned it into a vegetable market, which is way cheaper mm -hmm. to run, then that would completely eradicate the situation of the disease that we're suffering today. It's literally because of meat consumption. Two thirds of the world's population is lactose intolerant, yep. which makes me wonder, and I'm, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe we are not meant to consume another animal's milk. The saturated fats and the linoic acids from meat allowed our brains to grow to what they are now. Yeah. We wouldn't have made that evolutionary jump without meat. Well, welcome to the show. So out of curiosity, how many members in the audience here are vegans? We have one vegan, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, now to the question and to our debate today. How many of y'all think that amidst the whole vegan revolution that we have right now, the meat industry is actually going to die? Show of hands, please. That's two people. Looks like it is going to be easy for you today. <laughs> so in the studios right now, we have Manisha Advani, the founder of Soul Sante Cafe, and we have Hatem Matar from the Matar Farms. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Right, so I'm going to start with this on screen. The number of Americans identifying as vegans rose 600% between 2014 and 2018. The Vegan Society in the UK showed an increase of 350%. And in Australia, the food products carrying a vegan claim increased by 92% in that time. My question to you, Hatim, right now is, do you not see a vegan revolution happening right now? Are these numbers reflective of that? 100%. Uh we know that there is a revolution happening, and I don't classify it necessarily as a vegan revolution, um, but as a revolution in nutritional awareness. Um, and when I say nutritional awareness is people now know what they're ingesting. Uh, back in the day, uh, I grew up, I'm an 80s kid, mm -hmm. um, we didn't look at the labels of things. Uh, we didn't know what was in the food that we were eating. Um, people nowadays, uh, because of the advent of the internet, because of how easily information is accessible, uh, the revolution that's happening is a conscious, nutritional, educational revolution in the food industry as a whole. And I wouldn't classify it necessarily as vegan or vegetarian or otherwise. All right. So you don't really think this is a vegan revolution with all of these numbers on screen? No, I think <laughs> there is a lot of people that are moving away from what would traditionally be nowadays. Everything has a label, obviously. Yeah. What would necessarily be called a flexitarian um, diet where people sure. eat. Um, everything but meat in scarce quantities and went from vegetarian to vegan. So right now, there's within the brackets, I'm not sure if you noticed that, Manisha, it's increased from 1% to 6%, that is between 2014 and 2018. But even now, the number is around the 6% mark in uh, the US. It, it hasn't increased drastically since. Uh, so it's still not really a competition for the meat industry, right? Considering the numbers are pretty low. Uh, I don't think so. Um... Actually, we, this was just the U.S. Hmm. So um, U.S. was the first one to start building this awareness, obviously because of their media presence. Um, in the UAE now, the numbers have risen drastically. That's why I opened a vegan cafe. So a great opportunity to make money over there. And it's not just, uh, like he said, I'll play on that part, awareness. So they're becoming more aware on their uh, on their part, on the aspect of health. For example, um, definitely flexitarian is thing of today mm -hmm. so let's say they'll eat meat like once or twice a week and they'll prefer to stick to a mainly vegetarian or vegan diet throughout the day so not necessarily just appealing to vegans so these numbers do help me because i have a new market to play on mm -hmm. but also definitely the number of people just uh, becoming more aware and eating a better quality produce um taking more care of their health yeah. and definitely seeing the impact of meat reduction in their diets and in their health is uh, really helping us. Over All right, here. just to understand, when you talk about veganism right now, are you talking about a diet change or a lifestyle change? 
So I see where you're going with that. Um, I definitely like to stick to like plant based mm -hmm. um, because I want it to be like a diet change at first. Right. Um, but veganism on a whole um, would obviously involve everything else. But I'm just going to stick to the diet today because we're both from the food industry. All right. So it's more <laughs> relatable for us. Great. So there are a number of reasons for why people opt to become vegan from health reasons to animal cruelty and the ethical aspect of it and environment. So let's talk about environment a little bit for now. 70% of the world's fresh water is used for agriculture, especially for farmed animals. Animal-based agriculture is responsible for 14.5% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gases and 9% of carbon emissions. Hatim, how exactly are you going to come back from these staggering numbers? That's a tricky number, but um, what's at stake here is not the meat industry. What's at stake here is mass production. Mm -hmm. um, when Gerald Ford created the vehicle, created the car, yeah. people were not having the debate whether the car was better than the bicycle because there was a certain amount of vehicles on the road, mm -hmm. there was a certain amount of bicycles on the road, and there was a balance between the two because it was not mass produced. Yeah. Now that cars are mass produced, what is the conversation? The conversation is that cars are bad for the environment. It's not that cars are bad for the environment, it's that a lot of cars are bad for the environment. Right. If you can understand that in that analogy, towards the meat industry, and when we say meat industry, I don't want to generalize You know, chicken, beef, poultry, fish, whatever it is, the, the problem here is not um, the meat industry. The problem here is the mass production of any food, of anything mm -hmm. um, that you can quantify as mass production. Right. Um, think about um, producing what is, you know, what we call uh, unethical. Um, the farms that are grain fed, slotted, caged. Um, their cost of production, what they're trying to do is get you an animal as quickly as possible, mm. as fast as possible for the least amount of money, yep. right? Versus somewhere that has open grazing contributes to the biodiversity uh, of the country, of the plant, of the entire ecosystem. Compare that and that carbon footprint versus what you would call mass-produced meat, and you'll find that they're over 75% less carbon intensive than the ones that are factory farmed. Very interesting. So basically you're trying to say that consumption isn't the problem. The way it's happening right now with mass production, manufacturing, processing, that's the issue. But I saw Manisha shaking her head. I she still that, is course, shaking yeah. her head. She does not agree. I disagree so, completely. Why? <laughs> Let's just stick to dairy industry for now. The factory farming, I agree, is completely inhumane, but still cows exude 50% of the methane gases mm -hmm. that are available in the environment. Yeah. So it's not about conscious consumption. No one's going to be conscious. Like, no, you can't expect everybody to be conscious of what they're eating every day. Everybody is not like, let's say, a health coach or a personal trainer yeah. or really going to stick to their diet. You know, you're not going to be on a strict diet every day. He said two to three times a week. Who actually really does that? Do I eat, do I eat healthy two to three times a week? I'm going to eat out. I'm not going to eat healthy. I'm going to have fries. But that's not the issue. The issue here is what are we doing to the environment? Limited resources available. Are we really going to use all of these grains just to feed this one cow, which in turn is only going to essentially feed only a few people, whereas those same amount of grains mm -hmm. can feed 16 to 17 people? Yeah. With limited resources, with what's happening to the environment, the population is going to keep increasing. He was speaking about cars. The issue wasn't that there were like the cars were bad. The issue was there were way too many cars. Mm -hmm. But the population is going to just keep increasing so we can't curb population right. this is not back in the day china where you could only have one child you can't do that yeah the population is always going to keep increasing that is a very interesting point though so right now the rate that the population is increasing can we really produce enough meat without really wrecking the environment no absolutely not and i'm saying the same thing uh, that manisha is saying we're not asking the population to constantly consume meat. We're actually eat, asking people to eat less meat, by the way. Mm -hmm. The industry as a whole, yeah. Australia uh, in general, where uh, cattle are grass-fed, they have a lot of conjugated linoic acid in, in, in the meat because they're allowed to uh, graze freely. Mm -hmm. um, what you'll find is since the 90s, the Australian red meat industry, along with mass manufacturing, is the only industry that reduced their carbon footprint by over 65%. How did they do that? Uh, by improving the way they produce the meat, right? And it was an awareness that, listen, this is very, this is very heavy mm. as a resource. Right. For us to produce one kilogram of meat, it was using, I'm not sure the number, but 70 liters of water or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Exactly like Manisha said, it's a lot of grain. What a lot of people don't know is that if you are grazing your cattle, your sheep, Sequ uh, carbon sequestering. Mm -hmm. 
what you do when you plow a field to grow soy, to grow avocado, to grow cashews, to grow almonds, that are very water intensive crops that are grown all over the world, by the way. But is it really as high as that, those yeah. numbers? No, 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 no. But just as high, if not higher, actually 1.5 times higher, is the importation of fresh fruits and vegetables like strawberries and blueberries. Yeah. Because someone wants to put it in their vegan smoothie, okay. they'll fly <laughs> blueberries from somewhere mm -hmm. where blueberries are available into Dubai that doesn't grow blueberries. Right. The carbon footprint for that, along with the jet that it took to get it there in time before it flew, uh, before it goes bad, yeah. is actually more than poultry and beef. Going back to the Stone Ages, the caveman era, so we've known that naturally we there is enough proof to substantiate that we are omnivores. We eat both meat and plants, basically, right? So keeping that in mind, do you think that it's not meat consumption, which is a problem, I think, which is what you're trying to get at. It's it's the way it's happening right now. And if that changes and we go into more organic ways of producing meat, will that sort of solve the problem? So let's look at this. Um, Stone Ages, cavemen, I was literally watching the same documentary that you're talking about today, uh, Forks Over Knives. Okay. Okay. And they were talking about why people in the Stone Ages, why um, what, they were con they were consuming meat, hunters, gatherers. These are our ancestors. We should learn from them. Yeah. But we're evolving as a species, right? Before there were we were walking, then there were bikes, there were cars. Right. So we're becoming more cultured. We before we wouldn't sit in a restaurant and dine like cultured environment. Yeah. But we're doing that now. So it's not necessary that what our ancestors were doing we have to do as well. Second, it is inhumane to kill any animal or any person. The practical definition of inhumane is compassion. Mm -hmm. Compassion means you don't kill anyone. But what happens anything. to the food chain then? I mean, isn't that what's happening in the natural There are food? lions for it to eat that. There are lions there. And we're not animals. We're cultured human beings. Mm -hmm. We're not an animal who exists um, in the jungle, in the wild. Right. We're cultured human beings. We don't need to kill. We have enough produce available to consume. And as he was talking about, let's say, carbon footprint, et cetera. Okay, then let's, let's create an environment where we can, we can grow all of these vegetables. He has a farm, right? So he's growing vegetables and fruits at the same time. Now we have vertical farming. We have hydroponics. Yeah. Everything is available. So as we go along, we become more and more and more cultured. Mm -hmm. in, in order to do that, we need to adapt. We need to change and we make room for everything else that's available instead of just Harvesting but animals. do we have to change then? There's a, a lot of debates here. There's mm -hmm. an ethical debate. Yeah. There's a scientific debate. Mm -hmm. There's an environmental debate. And there's no way we could get through all three. On the, on the caveman side of things, it is a proven fact that scientifically, the only reason we went from being Cro-Magnon man to turn, we're, our, our classification now in the human evolution is Homo sapien. Yeah. The only reason Homo sapiens developed the size brain that they do is because they ate nutrient dense foods that nutrient dense food is meat. Mm. The saturated fats and the linoic acids from meat allowed our brains to grow to what they are now. Yeah. We wouldn't have made that evolutionary jump without meat. Again, I'm just thinking out loud. Sure. Two thirds of the world's population is lactose intolerant, yep. which makes me wonder, and I'm, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe we are not meant to consume another animal's milk, right? Look, there's uh, there's a debate there uh, that goes into allergies as well. Yeah. Allergies are on the rise. Yeah. People are not designed, or people have a, a deathly allergy now from uh, peanuts. Does that mean biologically that human beings are supposed to stop eating nuts? Right? It's not a question, it's genetic. Mm. I have the capability to ingest this, whereas you do not. Right. How are we going to segregate society and segregate countries and nutrition based on our genetics? There's also a lot of health concerns associated with consuming red meat, for example, 100%. which is cancer. I don't know if it's a myth or reality at this point. It's true. Um, so um, if you look at a study that was done um, and research that was done when uh, Hitler, back in the day, when Hitler took over Austria and all these places, mm -hmm. what he did was in one, in two, three different cities, he took away their whole livestock, all meat, pigs, cow, rabbits, sheep, everything. Mm -hmm. So the city or the, uh, we're left with just, um, vegetables, just the plant-based diet. Yeah. Over the next one year, their, ch their, uh, mortality rate went down. Um, their chances of heart disease went down. Mm -hmm. Um, all of these facts changed. Obviously there's significant studies shown that eating a mainly plant-based diet reduces heart disease risk. You said fish oils, um, that's available from linseed oil. Uh, if you look for sources, 
non-synthetic sources, you can find them. Hemp seeds have DHA and all those other vitamins he referred to. I, I'm a health coach. Oh, it's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sorry, yeah, go. Sure. I didn't yeah, interrupt sure. no, you, no though. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Do you want to finish your point and then you can yes, come yes, back? Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. I'm a health coach. Uh, I'm a certified personal trainer. And um, I'm fine. Um, I'm 30 years old now. I'm okay, and uh, you can check my blood work. Mm -hmm. um, it's great shape and form. Let's talk about, thank you. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, some Olympians, you know. Um, I'm sure you watched the movie and you saw the studies and they're perfectly fine. Marathon runners, Olympians, strongman athlete. I'm a CrossFit athlete. I lift. I can lift way more than someone who's eating meat right next to me. We should probably do that now. Yeah, let's, let's try yeah. to lift <laughs> off. She wins on that side. Perhaps <laughs> later, yeah. yeah. Definitely, so you know, um, the nutritional density of these foods that are available for us, like he said, education. Education is key. If you look, mm -hmm. you'll find it. Um, dairy farmers, uh, when you were talking about being lactose intolerant, the three dairy farmers that went out of business in uh, the States, um, two of them became almond farmers. Okay. So they farm almonds now because almond milk is on the rise. Right. Um, I understand it's becoming really processed. I agree. Mm -hmm. And it's the way we're consuming it. And that's why we need to educate. Yeah. But still, treating the animal in an inhumane way has stopped. Yeah. You know, at least we're not harming someone. Yeah, let's just go back to the health point because I know Hatim has a lot to say. No, I, what I wanted to say, um, I mean, I was a professional athlete. I was a sponsored fighter. Okay. Uh, I won the world championships in jiu-jitsu in 2009. And I can tell you, honestly, I went vegetarian mm. two weeks before my tournament. Okay. I, dro I dropped my weight. It improved my cardio. I slept better. Oh, you're agreeing with her. No, th <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, this is, this is why I think I'm telling you we're on the same side. Okay. My point is, um, when I did that for a short amount of time, it improved drastically the things that I was looking to improve. A friend of ours, my cousin, who I, we almost stopped talking to actually, uh, stayed on his vegetarian diet and he's still vegetarian to this day. Okay. His blood work uh, on the flaxseed and the linseed, um, his blood work um, actually over three, three years in, because we always have to get tested, three years in um, actually deteriorated. Um, not because he wasn't consuming all of these things, but because of the amount of mm -hmm. flaxseed and linseed that he would have to consume it was almost impossible for him to do, mm. right? A little bit of fish versus, and I'm, I'm not joking, versus spoonfuls of fish oil or linseed oil or flaxseed to be able to get the same amount. Right. Again, that's not sustainable. Neither is uh, the almond farm that's producing instead of cow farms because almonds are very water intensive. There is a middle ground between us. Mm -hmm. And the middle ground between us is for people not to have access to things like chicken tenders where they're grinding stuff up and turning it into something that looks like chicken. Right. Right? Um, your marbled beef, if there isn't white, strikes, uh, white stripes through your beef, that's bad beef. All right, very interesting. So I think now we need to move to the economics of it. Uh, I have a few numbers here. So this is uh, Waitrose that had announced back in 2018 that the sales of vegan and vegetarian products are up 85% compared to 2017. And to celebrate this success in the meat-free category, the supermarket decided to add 25 new products to their own brand line. So there clearly is a demand for vegan products right now. And it is making a clear business case. I mean, we saw it here in Dubai as well. Dubai has become very vegan friendly, why the UAE has become very vegan friendly. So what exactly would your aspect in terms of profit profitability be over meat-based industries? Demand is supply. If you have a demand, you'll supply. And the more you supply, the more availability there is, mm -hmm. the higher the demand. It's just a constant chain reaction. Um, you know, we learned this in high school also. So I definitely believe there's a lot of room to make money. Why else would they make the movie Game Changers? There was, there was a study that showed that Game Changers were only, was only made because Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lewis Hamilton, and all these other celebrities had invested in vegan-friendly or vegan products. Yeah. Protein powder, Beyond Meat, etc. But why? They would obviously only... They're way smarter than us, mm. obviously, in terms of making money. They've made a lot of money. So you got to respect the fact that, look, they're coming from an industry where they obviously know how to make a lot of money. So they would obviously only invest in something where they see high profitability. In yeah. Uh, Beyond Meat is killing it. So obviously the actual patty is available for only 30 dirhams, but every single supermarket is selling 45, mm -hmm. 50. Uh, Impossible Burger has been, is being sold for 100 dirhams. Yeah. So since you're mentioning it, can I ask you, so all these alternative meat options, are they a friend or a foe for you as a part of the vegan community? Personally, 
my cafe, we really, he was saying, just really become aware of consumption. Mm -hmm. My cafe, we don't serve these things. Okay. Um, because one, they're really, uh, some of them are processed. I personally don't eat soy, so I don't like to serve soy. Right. Yeah. Uh, personally. Yeah. Um, but uh, definitely a friend in terms of where someone is a flexitarian, they want to try something out. It's like, it's like a McDonald's. If McDonald's is vegan, mm -hmm. th that beyond meat would be the McDonald's. So I get it. It's, if it's fried, it's bad for you. Um, processed bread is bad for you. Processed food is bad for you in general. Right. But still, the protein content itself of Beyond Meat is extremely high. Yeah. I think it is around 20 grams of protein. We'll consider them as your friend in for this discussion, but definitely an enemy for you. You get back into the conversation of what's going into that patty for, make, for it to taste like it does yeah. and look like it does. And if you ask the right questions, you'll know that some of those patties, without naming names, have GMO modified foods to be able to make that patty look and smell and taste the way it does. Now, do we have the conversation and do we trace it back to, is it okay to have GMO food so we can make something taste like meat? Yeah. Are we modifying this? What is the effect on your genetics? What is the effect on your genome? What is the effect on the next generation? Do you understand? Um, I don't think it's a friend. I don't think it's a foe. Uh, I think, and we're gonna be friends after I say the sentence, I think if the vegans were so um, horrible, like horrified, at eating meat, they wouldn't want all of their food to taste like meat. For the purpose of this conversation, we discovered a lot of reasons why meat eaters are becoming vegans, but one of the main reasons why they remain meat eaters or non-vegetarians is the taste aspect of it, right? And it also reflects in these numbers, so the market for alternative meat can reach $140 billion over the next decade, and that rapid pace of growth implies the animal-free industry could capture 10% of the $1.4 trillion global meat industry. Again, huge numbers. We also saw that uh, a report by AT and Kearney said that 60% of all the meat that we get are not going to be from slaughterhouses. It's probably going to be alternate meat by 2040. So this isn't good for the meat industry clearly, mm. right? So do you think this is going to take over the meat industry? I don't think so. Um, there is always going to be a demand and there is always going to be people producing, even if it is a niche, even if it is uh, an industry that changes the way it produces, uh, that reduces the amount it produces. Um, mind you, the cost of this takeover, mm -hmm. you're talking about the G20, yeah. right? The underdeveloped world is still going to eat exactly the way it does because it is the only thing that it can afford. Yeah. You cannot go tell the underdeveloped world and say, I'm sorry, this is unethical. Mm -hmm. I won't get my nutrients if I don't eat this, right? So in the underdeveloped world, if uh, they have access, and that's always what the question is, mm -hmm. do you have the purchasing power to make... Uh, healthy decisions, yeah. to make environmentally friendly decisions. In the U.S. alone, um, the people that are always at risk of heart disease and obesity are the people that are earning minimum wage. So even if they wanted to be healthy, they could not afford to go to the stores mm -hmm. that afford them the chance to buy organic vegetables, organic meat, organic milk. Yeah. Instead of $8, they're spending uh, $18. But instead. I must say I the prices are coming down, though, so rapidly, I think from 2015 onwards, the prices have been declining. So what if they find out or figure out the technology to make the prices really low and on par with the prices of actual meat? So I just wanted to add to what he said, um, or rebut. Um, he was talking about uh, it not be being readily available, whether it's cheaper, we said Beyond Meat is expensive, etc. and you said the price has already gone down. So there was a study in, in the Philippines. So when the Philippines was going through a really bad time, um, people took food to supply to them, and the rich people already had enough food, so they were supplying to the poor people. In the beginning, they were supplying meat, mm -hmm. but towards as time went on, they realized that supplying lentils or beans, stuff like that, was cheaper. And uh, it, each cup of lentils actually has 18 grams of protein, which is plenty. Yep. So it's much cheaper. Everyone can afford it. Why are why is the coronavirus going on right now? Because of the China meat market. Mm. He said educate them but they're poor yeah. so if we completely eradicated that market and we turned it into a vegetable market which is way cheaper mm -hmm. to run then that would completely eradicate the situation of the disease that we're suffering today it's literally because of meat consumption yeah that's it and then they realized that in the philippines where these people that they supplied to great grains to the poor people, their heart disease went down. Then they looked back into the rich people of the Philippines yeah. who can afford a better diet, they can afford anything. They found out that these people were actually consuming meat 
and in turn having a higher rate of heart diseases. Right. So they were actually unhealthier than the poor people. Yeah. So definitely more affordable and um, eradicates all these diseases that we're having. <laughs> yeah, especially now, I think you've brought the conversation up at, at the very right time. So it's not just coronavirus, we saw Corona, Nipah, SARS, SAR, SARS MERS, etc. So all of this have started from animals at some point. But again, that's a, a conversation for another day. Thank you so much for joining us here. We do have time for some audience questions. So is there anybody with a question? Ananda Shakespeare, Dubai Vegan Days. I run a vegan pop-up in Dubai. So my first question would be for Haytham, and it would be how can you compare cars and bikes and manufacturing to um, to the vegan cause? Um, people are vegan for three reasons, either for the environment, for health, or for animal rights abuse. So um, a lot of, um, for a lot of vegans, money and uh, mass consumerism doesn't come into it at all. You can't compare um, you know, money or economics to the fact that people are killing animals, murdering animals for food. Um, it's completely un unnecessary to do so, in my opinion. So to answer that question, like I said, um, there is an ethical debate, there is a scientific debate, um, and the, the point that I brought up in that situation was for the environmental piece. I wasn't talking yeah. about the ethics. Um, the ethics is something that you can go down into, you know, and probably speak on for a couple of years without getting uh, an answer. Um, the Japanese have a traditional history of whaling. Um, the UN put a moratorium on whaling. Mm. They stopped whaling for a long time until they said, listen, this is part of our culture, yeah. the Inuit culture in Canada. This is what we do and have done for thousands of generations. For us, wherever we're from, to impose our culture and our belief system on another people is the same thing as someone saying this is inhumane. Why is one right and one and one wrong? All right, great. Anyone else with a question? I just want to ask in, in terms of, you know, I was a Star Trek fan, so I, I always enjoyed in the series that they could just press a button and get a replicator yeah, of food. Yeah, so yeah. It, when I interviewed before, because uh, I'm a journalist for Arabian Business, by the way, um, the Nestle future of food, they did say that with 3D printing, you can just print out whatever food you want with synthetic-based protein based in a lab and you can have it taste like a plant or a meat mm -hmm. what do you think of that uh, first of all live long and prosper um <laughs> what uh, what i would say about that is uh, in that case it's not a question of um nutrition or ethics it's a question of palate would people eat meat grown in a lab or 3d printed um could you make it palatable could you make it um could you put it on a menu and tell people um, this came from a 3D printer and people would be um, interested in eating it. Um, there's a lot of crops in the UAE and in the desert that are irrigated with grey water. Uh, and you know what grey water is? Obviously, it's treated sewage water. If people knew the crop that they were eating came from treated sewage, would they eat it? You're saying it's a psychological thing, but then now there's already a lot of cell-based meat being grown Correct. right now. Yeah. And it has also been consumed and that is going to become a huge market. So part of the 60% that is going to be from the non-slaughterhouse uh, meat, this is one of the parts. Mm -hmm. So there clearly is a demand for that as well, isn't there? Yes, yes, I agree. I don't think um, they're in competition uh, I don't think the food industry um, should be in competition with itself. I, should, I think it should be aware of itself. I think FMCG, uh, without naming any names, is, I mean, the biggest five FMCG companies in the world are also the owners of the largest vegan and organic uh, food products in the world. Mm -hmm. Their carbon footprint is huge. What they do to the environment, nobody takes a toll that you know, this brand is the one that's doing it or this brand, right? Because it's the FMCG company as a whole. Yeah. What we need to do is be responsible as adults, as children, as community members, as family members for the food that we produce as well as the food we consume. And you make that con decision with your dollar spend or your dirham spend. Um, I went to a college where they invented a 3D printer. And in the beginning, the printer was really expensive. Manufacturing is re really, ex really expensive. Everything was really expensive. Now... 3D printing is actually very cost effective. The materials used, they're using 40% less water than they were for like a normal building. So obviously as technology goes on, as we move forward, it's gonna become cheaper, hopefully more palatable for people who wanna consume the meat. And also we're gonna consume less water, which is great for the environment. And in the aspect of where he said, for example, organic foods and top five FMCGs investing in these, and creating a big carbon footprint, then yeah, of course, we have to educate ourselves. That's why 
I only source locally. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as you can, you have to do your part definitely as human beings. It's interesting, right? People are moving towards organic, but then there are industries coming up with these alternatives like lab-grown, cell-based, etc., 3D printing. So it's very interesting. That's probably for another conversation, another day. I'm going to come back to the audience again to ask the question that I asked in the beginning. Right now, after the 20-minute discussion we've had, how many of y'all think that the vegan industry is going to kill the meat industry soon? That's still just two people. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. That's all on today's episode of ABTV's Crossfire Debate. We will be back again next Wednesday with another topic with two more interesting guests and so much more to discuss. Until then, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and of course, like, follow and comment on this video.